It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to the Miller Center's American Forum. In recent weeks, as Americans have seen and heard of even more beheadings of innocents and other once unimaginable acts by the terror organization calling itself the Islamic State, and even an attempted attack on American soil by two men apparently inspired by that group, we've been reminded yet again that our country's long military and covert engagements in Iraq, Afghanistan, and now Libya, Syria, and many other dangerous geographies have in no way brought a resolution to the tectonic conflicts of the Muslim world or its relationship with the United States. The apparent destruction of the Al-Qaeda terrorist organization responsible for the September 11 attacks brought no end to the threat of terrorism in our time. So in this episode, we return to our continuing series of special programs called Aftermath of the Endless War, in which we've gathered soldiers, generals, diplomats, and journalists to discuss the consequences of this long conflict for America, our military, and our place in the world. Throughout all of this, there has been a persistent question. Is this a war between the Muslim and Christian worlds, or is it something else? President George W. Bush and then-President Barack Obama have repeatedly insisted that it is a war on terrorists and criminals, not a crusade against Islam. Yet even that has been criticized by those who say the Islamic State so deeply violates the Muslim faith that it's wrong even to call it Islamic. Meanwhile, some conservatives increasingly argue that Islam is a backward and dangerous religion that explicitly encourages violence and terror. Are they jihadists or just terrorists? Our guest today is Peter Bergen, CNN's national security analyst and a longtime expert on global terror. In 1997, he produced for CNN the television interview in which Americans saw for the first time a then obscure radical figure named Osama bin Laden and heard him declare war on the United States. He has written numerous books on al-Qaeda and the manhunt finally leading to the death of bin Laden at the hands of U.S. Navy SEALs in May 2011. His most recent is an edited volume on the consequences of drone warfare. He's also a vice president at the nonpartisan New America Foundation in Washington, D.C. Peter, thanks for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Um, when you were last here, you talked about a book you had just completed uh, on the manhunt for Osama bin Laden and his recent death at that point. Uh, now it's three years later, and the bad guys of 9-11 have finally been punished in some respect. But has any real progress been made for America's place in the world? Well, it depends what your yardstick is for that. I mean, if we'd had this conversation in 2002 and, you, you, and somebody said, well, only two dozen Americans roughly would, be, you know, would die at the hands of jihadist terrorists in the United States uh, in the next you know, almost a decade and a half, you would have said that seems implausible. So if the standard is, is America, is America being kept safe by, from terrorism, the answer is surely yes. I mean, uh, you know, about two dozen Americans get killed every year by dogs, so you have a probably you know, 10 times more likely to be killed by an, uh, by an angry dog than you are by a terrorist in this country. So the likelihood is incredibly low. Uh, so by that standard, we've been very successful. And I'm, in the introduction, I actually did a little bit of a semantic trick. I said uh, the al-Qaeda organization responsible for the 9-11 yeah. attacks has been destroyed, arguably. Uh, that doesn't mean that al-Qaeda in every sense has been destroyed. But, but walk us through that, because I think that's something that a lot of Americans don't really understand. We don't, for the most part, we don't know what ISIS really is or the Islamic mm. State. We don't really, uh, but in terms of that it is, in effect, a derivative of a version of al-Qaeda, uh, though those are two, now two groups that are at odds with each other. But yeah. how did that happen? Well, Freud has a marvelous term, the narcissism, narcissism of minor differences, which I think explains a lot of human activity. And the difference between, uh, you know, Al Qaeda Central and ISIS is very, very minimal. Um, it's like the difference. It's it's less of a difference than there was between Maoism and and the Soviets in terms of ideo ideological. I mean, they're. In fact, interestingly, ISIS still regards Osama bin Laden as a real hero, even though ISIS is um, has publicly rejected Al Qaeda, and Al Qaeda has publicly rejected ISIS. 
Uh, if you look at ISIS propaganda, they still regard Osama bin Laden as a very important kind of leader and figure. And so really we're talking about the ideology of bin Ladenism uh, that is Al-Qaeda and ISIS and a lot of other groups. And what is the ide ideology? Uh, ideologies are a way of explaining uh, all you know, history and, and our lives in an all-encompassing manner. And we've seen a lot of them come down the, 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 you know, in history we've seen a lot of them. They tend to be very damaging, uh, whether they're Marxist and secular or, or, or religious. But this is a religious ideology that claims to explain everything. Um, and I, you, you can call it bin Ladenism or you can call it you know, ultra-fundamentalist violence, Salafi jihadism or whatever you want to call it. But it, it is a religious ideology. Uh, going back to the question you posed at the beginning, uh, it is something to do with Islam. It'd be like saying the Crusades had nothing to do with Christianity. Well, that would be an absurd claim. It would be like saying that uh, the Jewish settler movement has got absolutely nothing to do with Jewish beliefs about the sanct uh, you know, sacred lands of Judea and, uh, and Samara. It would be like saying a lot of things that are not true. Uh, so, and I think the reason that people don't want to there's a kind of PC aspect to this where we don't want to criticize Islam. That's, um, and that may be defendable. There's also a kind of, we live in an increasingly secular society, so people are reluctant to accept that religious ideologies uh, are, are very real. Uh, and and um, so, you know, for a variety of reasons, I think that some people uh, don't want to accept that this has got something to do with Islam. And, you know, the Quran is not a book, it's the word of God, and uh, you can't change that fact. And so there are certain verses in the Quran, selectively picked, of course, that are very helpful to people like ISIS and bin Laden. Um, so this has got something to do with a particular version of, of religion. Uh, and that's, you know, if bin Laden, if you were interviewing bin Laden, he would say this is entirely to do with Islam. When we look back at the Crusades, when we look back mm -hmm. at a, a period of time when it was Europeans and Westerners and Christians uh, engaging in terrible atrocities against Muslims uh, in, in that, that story that we know in a certain way, uh, that was a lot more complicated than King Arthur going off to uh, try to find the Holy Grail and bring it back. Uh, but when we look back at that time and even the unfortunate parts of it, we don't stop and say, oh, that was a that was a perversion of Christianity. It's viewed, general, people generally think of that as this, this long ago time in which some unfortunate things happened, but it's not a reflection, as you say, on Christianity. But today, we very much so, or at least a lot of people very much so, associate these terrible perverse acts uh, as being a reflection of, of Islam. The, but obviously, that, that's not a fair kind of comparison, but... Well, I mean, is it, is the question. I mean, you know, you get into a territory that is uh, some people might find uncomfortable, but um, if you look at the people who are joining ISIS, they see the beheadings and the crucifixions and the sort of medieval punishments as part of the package that uh, actually ISIS really is recreating the caliphate because uh, the caliphate, after all, was a seventh century institution and it's in, at its inception. Uh, and uh, But this is actually more evidence that they're doing the right thing. In fact, the very things that we find the most appalling, throwing homosexuals from tall buildings to their certain deaths and stoning people to death for, you know, uh, who are accused of adultery and all these things. I mean, for the people who are being recruited to ISIS, this is more evidence that they're actually doing the right thing. Yeah, well, uh, let's, let's pin some of this down, because I think there's a lot of this that Americans really, truly don't quite understand. They've heard of this group that is the new terrorist organization that's causing a big problem, and they've heard an argument about whether uh, someone made a mistake, whether the Obama administration made a mistake by pulling out of Iraq and allowing this new group to do the things that it's done. That's the story that people have heard. But uh, I don't think that, A, that people really fully understand the connection back to Al-Qaeda. So mm -hmm. go back to that, uh, and, but then let's also talk about this uh, the the uh, theology, if you want to call okay. it that, of ISIS. Well, so Al-Qaeda in Iraq was founded by Abu Musab al-Zakawi, who was a sort of psychopathic killer who uh, became more radicalized in a Jordanian prison. And he, uh, he went to uh, Kandahar in, in southern Afghanistan in 1999. He was very loosely associated with Al-Qaeda, not really part of it. Uh, he, uh, when the Iraq war was beginning to, when it was obviously it was beginning to happen, he moved to Kurdistan in northern Iraq in preparation to kind of create a jihadist group that would uh, oppose the American invasion. Uh, and he had, you know, there was no, uh, Saddam Hussein had absolutely no links with Al-Qaeda. He, one of his generals may have met somebody within Al-Qaeda once, but it was more about trying to suss out who these people were. 
And so Al Qaeda established itself in Iraq uh, before the, you know, in, in, as the American invasion was happening, and it was a small group. Uh, but it came to real prominence when it blew up the UN, the UN building in Baghdad in early 2005, killing Sergio de Mello, basically forcing uh, a lot of Western institutions left after that because it became too dangerous. And then, of course, it provoked the civil war. Uh, it really, there was already a civil war, but it, it blew up the mosque at Samarra, which is the most holy place in, in Shia Islam, uh, with the absolute intent of creating a religious civil war in Iraq, which, it did, which of course it did. And uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was killed by an American uh, joint special operations operation in 2006, but he had created al-Qaeda in Iraq. ISIS is, the, is birthed from al-Qaeda in Iraq and has also benefited from former Ba'athists uh, who have military experience, who are basically running the show militarily. And then over time, though, as the Islamic State or ISIS uh, began to uh, perform acts that were viewed as beyond the pale, even by some other uh, Muslim activists like Zarqawi, right, that, yeah. but, that eventually Al-Qaeda in Iraq disavows the, and, and ISIS, Islamic State, becomes a break-off. Well, Al-Qaeda Central disavows ISIS. And confusingly, there is an Al-Qaeda affiliate in Syria called the Nusra Front, which is, I, I, Syria is now controlled by three entities, the Assad government, the Nusra Front, which is an Al-Qaeda affiliate, and ISIS. And the Nusra Front gets less uh, attention than ISIS, but it's, you know, a, it, a very, it's very philosophically very similar. Uh, and they've had great battlefield success. The, the, the people who have been marginalized are the moderate uh, Syrian groups. They don't exist in Syria in any real degree now. So the country is, and I, I think our de facto position has been the maintenance of Assad in power, even though people don't want to say that, because uh, of the three options, ISIS, Nusra Front, the Al-Qaeda affiliate, or Assad, for our purposes, the United States, Assad is the least unpalatable of those three. And in terms of the religious footings of, uh, of ISIS, the, it, it, fundamentally, I mean, there's much more to it than this, but it, it, it's a version of, it's an interpretation of Islam, I think we can safely say that, but it also is very much built around this one particular prophecy by the Muhammad that a great battle would come between the, the army of Rome, at, uh, as imagined at the time, and the armies of the caliphate, and that at this showdown at the city of Dabiq, uh, that, that that would be the point at which the caliphate would prevail over these armies. I, I, I don't know the numbers of Americans who believe we are living in the end of times, but it's surprisingly high, right? So, Chris, so this, this view about the, we living in the end of times is, is not on common view amongst Muslims. And uh, ISIS is really playing on that. So this, they have this sort of English language in-flight magazine that they've been publishing for a while on the internet called uh, Dabiq. And Dabiq is a town in Syria that ISIS now controls. And that, as, you, as you mentioned, Doug, the, the Prophet Muhammad is supposed to have said that the final confrontation between Rome and Islam would happen at Dabiq. Uh, and so for these guys, uh, they have this apocalyptic uh, view that uh, the end of time, in fact, they say that the end of times is likely to happen in 2020 in a recent, uh, uh, the Mahdi will come, the savior of Islam. So they, they, they truly believe this. And I think that part of their appeal is that some people believe that ISIS is really the vanguard. The reason they have these black banners is there's another prophecy from the Prophet Muhammad, which, uh, or at least saying of the Prophet Muhammad, because it's never really clear how, you know, how, to what extent these really were set by the Prophet Muhammad, but they are attributed to him with some degree of certainty or uncertainty, that there'll be uh, a group of, uh, under black banners from Khorasan, with Khorasan's an ancient name for the Afghan uh, area, uh, would come as essentially peep the, the saviors, the knights of Islam that would be saving Islam. So there's a reason they have these black banners. They, they believe, of course, the Khorasan, Al-Qaeda was based there. And, uh, and there is, in fact, now a Khorasan group inside Al-Qaeda in Syria who are people who came from that, that area to Syria. So in these guys' minds, they're bringing back, uh, they're part of the vanguard that will produce this end of times outcome which they, you know, in which Islam will prevail. Do these guys really believe that the end is near? ISIS has you know, thousands of pages of, in English about what they think, which I've been reading recently. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it necessarily as a sort of, uh, but, uh, but um, you know, it, they are, it's repetitive, um, and, and, uh, but it, it keeps coming back to this view uh, they, they, that, they, you know, that the end times are near, we're part of this, uh, come to the caliphate, we've established something perfect. Uh, and that's why we're seeing Westerners, including Americans, going, because they really believe. They're going to, going to 
you know, the caliphate is, uh, is not necessarily like joining ISIS for a lot of these people. They're, cu they're kind of going as supporters. I mean, you know, ISIS even had a classified ad of sorts in the first issue of its uh, English language magazine calling for doctors and engineers. I mean, they want to create a state, a real state, not just an Islamic state that actually provides services. And, is, and is, do they imagine that this is a state that then exists for some significant period of time? Or, I mean, what's, if, if the world's going to end in a few years, what's the <laughs> point of building the state? Well, uh, you know, logic is not part of this, I don't think. But uh, <laughs> the, um, you know, the, what, what is a state is an interesting question. I mean, a state uh, monopolizes violence. It controls ter territory. It controls population. It provides some level of services. In fact, the, you could make, I haven't even th hadn't thought about this till we just discussed it. You could say that, uh, is the Islamic State more of a state than Yemen now? Is it, you know, which is an internationally recognized state. And uh, uh, certainly it is a more functional place than Yemen. I mean, the bar, there's a very below bar, since that's a failed, totally failed state. Um, but ISIS uh, controls, you know, an estimated eight to nine million people, which is a population of Switzerland. It controls a territory uh, roughly the size of the United Kingdom. Um, you know, so, you know, its pretensions to be a state are, are you know, not completely absurd. And it has co control of uh, oil production capacity that, that allows it to finance yeah. itself other than just by having uh, patrons and another. And it's taxing people. You know, they, they do have some resources. And the thing about running an insert, you know, you, you're, they're paying people. So, uh, you know, one of the attractions if, in, in their literature is, you know, we'll give you free care. If you come and join us, don't, you won't pay for anything, no taxes. If you come and join us, I mean, we will tax other people. But the, uh, so it, it, um, it, it is a group that is uh, delivering some very basic governance. And I think that it, it, it can survive for a long time if it does two things. If it, if it behaves like Stalin and provides some level of social services, that's a pretty, uh, you know, I think that's a long-term project that works pretty well. I mean, obviously, they're taking huge hits from the U.S.-led uh, airstrikes, but, uh, but it may be a wash because they're getting about 1,000 recruits a month, or they were until recently. We're probably killing about 1,000 a month. Uh, they are losing territory in some places, but then they're gaining territory in other places. It's fascinating to me that on the one hand, uh, to the credit of uh, a lot of American leaders and American society to some degree, to the credit of President Bush immediately after 9-11, the very next day, I believe, he, yeah. he was making statements about that we're going we're gonna to retaliate here, but this is not going to be a war on Islam. And President Obama has repeated those things over and over again. Um, and then strangely, to my ears, maybe I'm naive, but strangely to my ears, uh, there now are both criticisms of one that that's too soft that that these from the right the conservative the from the right the criticism is you should be calling these these people yeah. is uh, fund, fundamentalist Islamic terrorists uh, but there's also a criticism from uh, from another advocacy end that says it's wrong even to make a vague association between Islam and ISIS uh, that 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 that's actually still being uh, prejudiced toward Islam somehow but it sorts out this three way uh, well describing things properly is the first step to knowing how to deal with them so if we don't accept that this has got something to do with it it's like, i mean if we let's do the thought experiment where this was uh, the, the i don't know if it was if, it, if this was a marxist group uh and that you know espousing marxist ideology uh, one way to undercut them would be to take them on on the basis of uh you know, Marx, Marxism as a, as, a, as a methodology that hasn't proved particularly useful um, for, you know, the human condition. So if this is really, I mean, this, this, I think the way to deal with these guys other than, you know, airstrikes is to undercut their ideology. And their ideology is religious. And if you don't accept that, how are you going to undercut it? Um, and the, peop the people who are best suited to undercut their religious claims are people who have some knowledge of, of Islam. I'm not saying that's the U.S. government or anybody, you know, un you know, probably in this room, because we don't know how, and, and it shouldn't be the U.S. government, because there's a kiss of death problem, which is, to have, we, you know, the U.S. government doesn't have a lot of credibility and uh, with the fence sitters who might be interested in joining this group, and secondarily, the lack of knowledge. But there is, so there are two forms of ways of dealing with ISIS. One is to say, look, uh, Islam essentially doesn't condone a lot of the things you are doing and say, you know, having the scripture to back that up, which obviously exists. But another thing is for the U.S. government is to just say, 
this is a group that defends Muslims, that says it's defending Islam, but its victims are overwhelmingly Muslim. And you don't have to be an expert in Islam to say that. It's just a, a factual statement. Uh, and we should, we should just, you know, negative advertising works in American politics because it's, and is used because it works. So uh, we should, one of the lessons of that, I think, is to use kind of negative advertising against ISIS and, and keep hammering on this theme of that they have overwhelmingly killed Muslims. But it also, at the same time, it, 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 it's important probably to say out loud that uh, uh, it does seem absurd when someone argues that it's wrong to associate Islam in any manner uh, with an organization that has Islamic in its name. I mean, that's a very right. absurd. It is. A, it, I mean, basically, it's absurd. You know, uh, Mormonism is often regarded as a heretical version of Christianity. I mean, there's, so heresies are, you know, just to say it's a heresy doesn't necessarily say it's got absolutely nothing to do with the kind of the fundamental religion that it's attached to. Yeah, you can't make it be forbidden to acknowledge these connections, even if it's ultimately heretical or apostasy of some sort, which is another part of this whole, does seem to be one of the, the core issues for the Muslim world, that this inability to tolerate heretics or apostates, uh, that, that that seems to be a big part of what the internal argument uh, inside that part of the world is. Well, apostasy is the gravest crime in Islam, um, you know, it's uh, so, and one of the reasons Assad is the perfect uh, villain in all this is that he's a secular dictator, which makes him an apostate from Islam. So he's also an Alawite, which is regarded as a very heretical form of a heretical form of, of Shiism for, from the Sunni perspective. Uh, so he's also, uh, and also he's uh, inflicted a totalitarian war on his population, uh, which is you know, it's one of the worst wars we've had, arguably since uh, World War II. If you saw the footage of Kobani yesterday from the drone, it looked like uh, Dresden. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and this gets to another issue which we haven't really discussed, which is, you know, there is a, of course, there's a religious aspect to it because there's a sectarian civil war going on here. Um, and it's a sectarian civil war that's regional, and Assad is just one of the, you know, those, it's going on in Syria, it's going on in Iraq. It's going on in Yemen now, and it is to some degree going on in Lebanon, and it's fueled also by two, well, you know, big states in that region, which is Iran and Saudi Arabia, and this has obviously something to do with the religion, and to pretend other, I mean, it, it's, you can't pretend otherwise. I mean, it would be like saying the, the wars of religion that led to the Treaty of Westphalia had nothing to do with Christian disputes about the nature of uh, the Trinity and Jesus and all these other things, which... I mean, we, it's hard, and I think that goes back to this question of living in an increasingly secularized society. I and mean, people would kill each other in the third or fourth century in, in the Christian world for, for incredibly arcane points of Christian doctrine that I can't even describe to you, even though I grew up Catholic. I mean, they, about the nature of the Trinity, but, you know, and people, many people would die as a result of these disputes. Uh, so this is what is happening in the, in the, and the bigger question here is ISIS is not a, ISIS is a symptom of a much larger problem which is ISIS is not causing this conflict. ISIS is, is, this, is the outgrowth of this conflict. And if ISIS disappeared tomorrow, there'd be something else. Because we have, I think that the, the, uh, the toothpaste cannot be put back into this particular tube now. Uh, you know, the, the, the regional sectarian civil war that is going on is likely to go on for my professional career. Um, and that's the big story here. It's not ISIS's a possibility of attacking the West, which is very low. We've only had one attack in the West by somebody trained in Syria, which was the attack on the Jewish Museum in Brussels on May 24th of last year, which killed four people, which was a tragedy. But this is not, you know, 9-11 or anything close. Yeah, and, and even this attack that happened in Garland, or this attempted attack in Garland, Texas, very recently, yeah. uh, where you there was a, a claim by ISIS and perhaps some evidence of uh, of some inspiration uh, for these the, uh, these two attackers, uh, who fortunately were and amazingly were uh, stopped in their tracks by a traffic cop. That's an amazing story. But yes, that even there, the the connection between that incident and the actual Islamic State or anything like it is is quite tenuous. It seems. Well, it raises a very interesting question because is it tenuous or is it not tenuous? Because in the, so what we know so far is this guy, the, one of the, he was, he tweeted that he was part of the Islamic State effectively before he did the attack. He was also in touch with a British ISIS supporter on Twitter. Now, they never met, uh, but there was some discussion. So the, at what point does those, uh, and I, I agree, I mean, I don't, this was not an ISIS-directed attack and they've opportunistically said it was theirs. 
But in a world where you can direct message on Twitter with somebody who's a member of ISIS, which a number of people in this country are doing, to what extent is that some form of, you know, uh, even though you don't meet physically and never will, uh, what you know that's a little bit different than just having no connection at all. Yeah, sure, and the, and and uh, and certainly that's the thing that a lot of people have been most fearful of uh, that the future would bring uh, the, yeah. these kind of wildcat operators inspired by each other and and that is what the future is going to bring. But it's a, there's a good news aspect of that, which is these people that we saw in Garland, Texas. I mean, they killed themselves essentially; they didn't kill anybody else. Um, so there's a natural ceiling to what lone wolves can do. We saw in Boston the two lone wolves brothers killed four people, which is a tra tra tragic. But it wasn't a national catastrophe like 9-11, where you know, 19 people aided by dozens of others killed almost 3,000 Americans in a single morning. It's a whole different. We have, our defenses are, so on 9-11, on there were 16 people on the no-fly list. Now they're 40,000. On 9-11, the FBI and the CIA didn't talk to each other, essentially. Now they're very well integrated. On 9-11, uh, there were 33 joint terrorism task forces around the country, now there are 104. On 9-11, there was no DHS, there was no TSA, there was no National Counterterrorism Center. There was, like, there was a huge, and we were spending, you know, we've, we've, we've taken a giant hammer to this problem, and we have basically, and you can't say this politically, you won't hear, say, hear Jeb Bush or Hillary Clinton saying this. In the, in the, you can hear some of this in President Obama's second term, saying we need to kind of scope this problem, and sort of admit that it's not sort of an existential, and, but politically it's very hard. So look at Benghazi, where the political cost of four people dying in an American consulate, which was you know, in a very dangerous country and undefended, uh, have been enormous. So you won't hear politicians saying, hey, we've managed the problem because the political cost of something that can even be remotely tied to ISIS, like Garland, Texas, or something, uh, is very high. But the fact is we've managed the problem. Uh, and even more so, uh, the, 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 the passengers of a plane are never going to allow anybody well, to take over Well, this is a very important again. point. So the biggest thing, I mentioned this laundry list of things that have changed. The biggest thing that's changed is public knowledge. Because if you, add, if you think about the, what, you know, the no-fly list, and the, you know, there's a million people on the tide list, which is people who may be somehow associated with terrorism. So if you add to that public knowledge that this is a problem, that changes a huge force multiplier. So for instance, who disabled the passengers on the plane uh, over Detroit on Christmas Day 2009. It's like this guy, there's a guy on the plane with smoke is pouring out of his crotch. This is not a normal thing on an international flight. And the plane, you know, the passengers and the crew disabled him before yeah. he could. But so public knowledge is a huge force multiplier. So we are, we are, we have layered defenses. Uh, it is very hard, even let's say for, so, so, you know, let's say somebody is inspired by ISIS. Well, they have to get a gun. Well, that's easy in this country, but then, they have to select the target, and then they have to be very careful about their communications. And uh, a lot of these guys are not that careful with their communications. Um, we've seen a lot of arrests of people who have fermented. Or, and there is a whole range of government informants. So, and not, not all of this is defensible. I think some of it is overkill. Um, you know, we, we're in a strange situation where occasionally the FBI will entrap people with mental problems, and they know that, into trying to do something, which I think is, you know, not... It's sort of unconscionable, I think. And the one thing we absolutely know is that if you go down to a mosque anywhere in America, yeah. the guy who uses the word jihad in any circumstance, anywhere He's, in right. the building, it is a 99% <laughs> probability that's an FBI agent or somebody working yeah, for yeah. the FBI. Yeah, it is a, somebody working for the government. Yeah, 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 there's no doubt about it. Yeah. So if you want to do jihad, don't talk to anybody no, else no, no, who no. uses the word jihad. Yeah, and, uh, and most Americans are conscious of this, and they, you know, it's, it's, it's not a good situation. Yeah. But so the series that we've been doing, Aftermath of the Endless War, I mean, it's, I mean, partly you're right on top of all the news that is happening around the Islamic State now and the, these terrible stories. Uh, and it's fascinating to hear you talk about these very current events, but, but also just the, this idea of trying to understand the consequences of this long period of war and sort through some of this. And so back on this, this to mm -hmm. me, strange religious discussion. And so there was this, um, this long article in the Atlantic Magazine uh, yeah. quite recently uh, that, that made a, an articulate, uh, a very researched argument uh, dis trying to dispel the idea that somehow the Islamic State is not uh, a, and a religiously motivated entity and that, it, and that we have to somehow get comfortable, not just on Fox News, but right. to get comfortable more generally with the idea that that, that is a very real aspect of the struggle. Uh, and you wrote a column uh, online that, uh, that cited that piece, that's generally supportive of the, the thinking there. But then there was a big reaction to that as well among a lot of progressives. There was a group 
a uh, think tank group called Think Progress that wrote a really detailed uh, denunciation of that piece and to some mm. degree of you, uh, and the thoughtfully done, uh, particularly the denunciation of you, no. Uh, <laughs> the, but, this, uh, but, I, but the thing that surprised me the most about it was that that piece had something like 10 or 15,000 shares on Facebook and elsewhere. I, mean, I think it was the most widely read Atlantic piece that is, uh, other than the one by my boss, Amory Slaughter, about sort of work family balance. I mean, it was in, in the 175 his, year history of. So it kind of struck a chord because it answered a, a lot of questions that people are having, which is, what is this about? And it did it, and not only in a, it did it in a very well reported way. You mentioned deeply researched. I mean, Graham Wood, who wrote it, he went around the world to talk to people. I mean, you know, it's, it's, cool. <laughs> it's interesting how reporting actually generates real uh, information rather than just sort of sitting at your desk. And, <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, I, my personal feeling about all this is I've spent a number, of, quite a lot of time with people who are either in Al Qaeda or on the fringes of the organization. And, then, you know, you're going to spend 99% of your time talking about religious issues, you know, uh, you know or maybe 95% of your time. Uh, you know, these are people who are religious fanatics. And I, you know, I mentioned I grew up Catholic. I went to a Catholic boarding school. My mother was at one point, we were going to become a nun. I, I feel like I sort of understand the impulse. That you, that you know, with, with, not not to kill people, but you know, where religion is your life, uh, and that is what religions are supposed to be, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're supposed to inform, and of course, you know, that it. Uh, so these, you know, to I think we're beating a, a horse that doesn't need to be beaten because uh, you know, it, to me, it's an open and shut case that this is something to do with religion, it, 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 I mean, because the people involved, that's all they're talking about. But so what all this also gets at is that it's not just a struggle between that part of the world and the United States. This isn't just about a hatred of the United States. You know, we are like sort of a side. I mean, yes, bin Laden was sort of declared war against the United States. But what was, it, what was that? Why did he declare war against the United States? He would declare war against the United States because the United States supported Saudi Arabia. That's the real. And, the, you know, he wanted regime change in Saudi Arabia. And he regarded the U.S. support for Saudi Arabia as... In, you know, absolutely integral to the sustainment of the Saudi royal family. So we were just like, we're really a sideshow in a much, in a basically something about it's sort of happening in the Arab world. And uh, now it's, this is even more true because now this is all infected with this sort of sectarian conflict. Uh, and, uh, you know, ISIS, by the way, if you, I, I'm now, we're now at the eighth issue of Tabeek magazine. In the first seven issues, there was virtually no mention of attacking the West. It's all about coming to the perfect Islamic caliphate. Um, so ISIS is even less preoccupied, really, uh, with, with much less preoccupied uh, with, uh, with the United States than Al-Qaeda was, uh, which is not to say that they won't try and ferment something or try and encourage lone wolves. But their main thing is we've created this perfect Islamic state. Come to it um, and help us. And now that we're in this, uh, this phase of the endless war, it seems, uh, and we're all trying to figure out ISIS, there's now this proliferation of books and, uh, and discussions of, of some of which are quite good. You've been to this one book, ISIS, The State of Terror, Jessica Stern, J.M. Berger. You've, you've uh, praised that book, another one that just landed on my desk. Uh, from Michael Weiss and Hassan Hassan, ISIS inside the Army of Terror. This book in particular uh, essentially makes the argument that, that ISIS is a cult, that that's the way to, uh, to, to make sense of them, uh, that it is a religiously oriented cult uh, that's more akin to... Uh, uh, a cult with heavy weapons. I mean, I think there are cult-like, you know, I, uh, when I was, I'm writing a new book uh, about Americans who joined the Jihad, and I, as I was writing it, um, I, I was interested in this question of like, there is a cult-like aspect to Americans who join the jihad. I mean, and, and you know, you, or anybody who's getting kind of drawn into this, and this is bigger than just ISIS. Okay, so you only associate with people who precisely share, share your views. You usually cut off links with your family because they, even if they're Muslim themselves, they don't share these views. You, uh, you change the way you dress. You start dressing in a very particular fashion. You do a lot of, you, you you also change the way you know you might decorate your your house and a whole slew. So, so the, to me, it seemed like cult-like behavior. And I emailed Larry Wright, who's a friend of mine who wrote this great book on Scientology, and just said, you know, what do you think? I mean, and obviously, Scientologists are not people who join ISIS, but there is, I think, they are. There are very similar types of activities where you cut yourself off from your family, society. You only associate with people who share your views to the letter. You change the way you dress. Uh, and, and it, you know, and it, and it's all encompassing. 
Um, so yes, I think a cult is a, is a good way to look at it, except that you know, this is also a cult with you know, thousands of people under arms and heavy weapons and armored vehicles and has a state attached to it. So how many cults in history uh, suddenly turn themselves into states is an interesting question. And in terms of these Westerners uh, who, are, who are going to, to, be, to try to become a part of this, that's another one of these areas where I've had my skepticism meter has, has triggered <laughs> a number of times uh, because we hear these enormous numbers uh, suggesting many, many thousands, but I, we don't see many, many thousands of dead Americans on the, on the well, battlefield. Well, okay, actually, I think, I think the numbers, I mean, I'll tell you what the numbers are. I mean, the numbers are, I think, are kosher. I mean, in a sense, uh, they are... Uh, you know, 700 Brits, 300 have returned. That, you know, these are numbers. I mean, the, every Western government is all over this problem. This is one of the reasons that it's going to be less of a problem than, than it might appear, because the big difference between the Afghan war, where we had no idea about the people who were going there and what they were going to do later, is that now we're all over this problem. Every Western government thinks this is their main national security problem. The Brits, the French, the Dutch, the Danish, the, you know, you choose, choose your government. And they have very precise numbers, and I, I'm not at all skeptical. And so the total number of Westerners is about 3,400 who've gone. Now, for most of them, it's a one-way ticket. Uh, a lot of them die there. Half the people we've done have sort of started looking at the, uh, the name foreign fighters. Most of them are Western because they, the Arab names are not reported very well usually. Uh, and half of them are dead. You know? So, I mean, you, there is a... You know, and, and ISIS doesn't want them to come back and, uh, and do things here. ISIS has not... I uh, know that's exactly right. Yeah. And there have been some other numbers thrown around at times, like 11,000 fighters and, uh, and you know, much larger numbers. The total number is 20,000 foreign fighters, but they, most of those are coming from the Arab world or other parts. Yeah, so the vast majority of these folks are, by one means or another, have some sort of connection back into this, uh, th this geographic conflict in some way. I mean, they right. may have ended up in another country, but, but there's... Yeah, so the, the numbers are 20,000 foreign fighters. 3,500 roughly from the West. Yeah. And from the United States, you know, uh, we, we, we at the foundation I work at, New America, we calculate there have been 62 Americans who have either joined or tried to join or supported others who have joined militant groups, in, in, so 62. Yeah, which is a lot fewer than the number of uh, Ku Klux Klansmen who are around uh, these days as well, I suspect. <laughs> Well, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I, would, I think there are probably more, <laughs> but it makes the point. Either way, whatever the answer is, uh, I think the point is the same. Um, when the Islamic State first registered on the radar screen, President Obama famously said, yeah. this is the JV team, the junior varsity yeah. team, uh, and appeared to be dismissive. Uh, was the U.S. government actually dismissive? And if so, how did that happen? I mean, I kind of shared President Obama's I shared the view. I thought when bin Laden died that this was going to be the end of it, or at least like this was, you know, Al-Qaeda Central was on the ropes, bin Laden's death with this huge punctuation mark that, you know, that the endless war that you describe would kind of peter out uh, with the death of bin Laden, but it, that didn't happen. And the reason I was, and I was sort of scared, so said some skepticism about, uh, there were a lot of people who were pushing the narrative that Al-Qaeda was very much still alive uh, were people who also pushed the narrative that Saddam and Al-Qaeda were aligned and Saddam was a real threat. So I thought it was more of a kind of particular political point of view rather than, and I was wrong. I mean, the, the, the facts, I mean, but also like, you know, his, his, it wasn't clear even to ISIS itself that it was going to take Mosul and no, they had no idea they were going to do so well. On the other hand, there were people in the U.S. government who were saying this thing is really, they were, and they were sort of marginalized. They were, you know, a lot, I think people in the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and others was saying this is more of a problem than, than, than you think. Uh, Do you think that that's partly, what, whatever the miscalculation was, obviously there was some miscalculation, whether it's a defensible one or not does, uh, is different, but... Uh, is this partly because we've entered into this period of time in American political life and political discourse where this is territory that is open for political playmaking by all sides sure. and whatever the president does? There is sort of no let's band together and give somebody some room in which to operate to deal with these serious problems. Instead, it's a it's a day by day argument over every step of every. Yeah, I mean, I think it's part of that. I think there's. there's I, you know, I think that the political costs of saying the truth about these issues can be very high, which is why, you know, President Obama, when he said, you know, the main problem is lone wolf's attacks in the United States and, you know, attacks on our overseas uh, facilities, he tried to scope the problem at a speech at National Defense University 
Uh, but you know, I just think politically it's very hard for people who aren't second term presidents to make those arguments. You're not going to hear people saying, hey, we're spending $80 billion a year on our intelligence. And I mean, the one part of the budget we don't hear about to reducing is anything to do with counterterrorism or intelligence, right? That's just a third rail. So, um, and also the American public is partly to, responsible for this because we've made it clear that you know, we have zero tolerance for any kind of terrorist attack. If you go back to the 1970s, um, I'm presuming many of the people in this room were alive at that time. Uh, you, you know, the, uh, you know, there was, I, I, I've just been re researching the terrorist the, the attacks that were happening in, in the United States. I mean, there were, if they were happening today, we would be freaking out because, you know, the Puerto Rican nationalists did 85 bombings in the United States. The in Weatherman, the 70s. Yeah, right. The Weatherman did two dozen, at least maybe 45. The, uh, you know, the Black Panthers did, you know, dozens. Uh, you know, there was, the, you know, a hijacking was a very routine phenomenon. There were 100 hijackings in the United States at that time. There were 260 around the world. I mean, there's no, hijacking is almost completely died out, except, the, or except on 9-11. So the point is, is that there's, you know, by, by historical standards, actually, terrorism is very low now, by, you know, by American historical standards. Of course, you're not, that's a fact, but it would be very hard to say politically. And we, so I don't, you know, we, we've got ourselves in a huge tizzy about these things. Uh, and by the way, the United States managed to survive the Civil War, Nazism, and the Cold War, where you know, mutually assured destruction was a you know, strong possibility. Uh, and those were existential problems. These are very minor problems. And you mentioned the Civil War. The United States survived the Civil War. One could argue that we should let this Civil War unfold, that rather yeah. than that we should just back away. We took 600,000 casualties to sort out our issues, or at least partly sort them out, 150 years ago. Uh, we took lots of casualties in our own religious wars when you go back to colonial times. We Christians went out and beheaded a lot of Native Americans. It's something that's forgotten, mm. is the bounty that was offered on the heads and scalps of uh, Native Americans, which was partly a religious struggle and a territorial struggle. Uh, should we, should we allow the benefit of history to these folks and just get out of their way and let them fight it out? I think if there was no oil there, that's what we would do and should do. <laughs> but I mean, uh, and I'm, that's not, I mean, why do we have, you know, if you do the thought experiment where Saudi oil reserves were in Peru, we would have a very strong relationship with Peru. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, I think also, I think, our, I think our position is that we won't, we're not, we, we are intervening, we are intervening, we're fiddling around the edges of that, of this regional civil war. We're not trying to do the thing. We're not doing the thing. The, the Amer By the way, the American people does, doesn't want another major war in the Middle East that we'd be involved in. So what are we doing? We're training 5,000 members of the Free Syrian Army. That, it's a drop in the bucket. I mean, yeah, ISIS has you know, 30,000 very, very committed people uh, and, and probably thousands of other people they control. On. We are, um, you know, training the Iraqi army, uh, but in Baghdad and not, not, not on the ground really where the oper operations are happening. So, I mean, that's a pretty small intervention. It's not, but, you know, the, and I think the President Obama's view, and I think it's very hard to second guess it is, okay, so in Syria, the two groups that are fighting each other that are the most effective are Al Qaeda and Hezbollah. Those are the two most effective groups and they're fighting each other. So how do we, <laughs> what's the plan here? And I think, you know, when historians write the history of the Obama administration, my guess is that the Libya, well, Libya will be seen as one of the greatest failures because it was a completely unforced error. In terms of Libya versus Syria, part of it does also come back to something about the American people. Uh, and that is that the, because Qaddafi was a name that uh, still associated with some, with a terrible evil act in the yeah. past that people had some active memory of, then the idea of getting involved there when there was an opportunity to do away with that, there were some real points to be scored or there was some, some sense of what that could be about, even though it then turned into something else. I was completely in favor. I thought it was a great idea, um, but it turned out to be a really bad idea. But, but I come back to the incoherence that we still seem to be stuck in. And, and even if we remain morally incoherent, strategically, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that we invade Iraq and whether 
whatever the explanations are, it doesn't turn out the way we expected. But then we don't really seem to, we go, not, it's not even 20 years later, you know, it's not like from Vietnam to Iraq, it's the very next day we're turning around and, and still having an active debate about whether we should jump into another one. And not a very uh, sensible debate, it seems. Well, you know, I mean, because I think the, the options of, the, look, I think it's like a Rubik's Cube, cube with no solution. Uh, or it will, the solution will take a long time. So when you do, when you try and solve a Rubik's Cube, you know, you kind of move it around. So like, okay, so we try and do a deal with Iran, which does, you know, there's a lot of good reasons to do that um, if you get the outcome you want. But that means the Gulf states think that we're aligned with Iran, and it's very common in the region to think that we're now trying to become... So the Gulf states start getting all, you know, then they start supporting groups that are fighting Iranian proxies like Al Qaeda. The reason Qatar is the reason Theo Curtis, an American journalist, was released by the by news for the Al Qaeda affiliate is because the Qatari government intervened. The reason the Qatari government could intervene is they've been supporting these guys for a long time. And so, when whenever you do something in the region, uh, you know it kind of creates some kind of maybe unexpected kind of. Uh, outcome that actually makes things worse. So, you know, so the Iranian, you know, the Saudis are now very concerned about Iran. So they, you know, start bombing in Yemen. They basically blow away what remained of the Saudi, of the Yemeni state, causing complete, you know, it's a complete collapse there, uh, which is going to be like, it's like Syria all over again, where the states, you know, states collapse, there's a civil war, there's the poorest country in the Arab world. And I think it's going to be very grim. And Al Qaeda is going to take advantage of it. The Cold War, again and again, looks like a better time uh, in, in all, of, all of history. Well, with a minor kind of caveat that if things had gone wrong, and they almost did in you know, 1962 and other times, you know, we all wouldn't be in this room because the planet would cease to have existed. So you know, that, that's the big difference. Uh, the Cold War was, turned out to be pretty stable, but it also had elements of instability that could have caused the end of civilization. So that goes back to the main point here, which is that ISIS is just... It's, it's, it's a very trivial problem. We're not to say that it isn't a problem, but it, it is not an existential problem. Let's talk about Drone Wars, the, yeah. the book that you recently yeah. wrote part of and edited. Uh, I don't want us to completely miss that. Um, yeah. the, and we've recently had this revelation of a drone attack in which some months ago now, that uh, in which two Westerners were killed, including an American, and that has sharpened the debate uh, around the use of drones again, who should control drones, all of that has come back to the surface. Uh, but I'm curious what your take is on that, but also on this broader idea of that whether drones are simply another bigger, better weapon, and if you're going to engage in war, then you should use the best weapons you've got and try to win your war the best way you can, or are there some unique moral questions that attach to the use of drones? I think on the latter, there aren't, uh, because uh, the moral questions that attach themselves to drones are the same that uh, attach themselves to all weapons, which is, you know, are we discriminating? Uh, are we, is the force proportionate? I mean, this is true whether it's artillery or drones. The, the separate question is, are drones merely flying artillery or are they something different? And I think they are something different because they, they, they're really a symptom of the information. If this is a, 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 a word I'm coming up with, uh, which may not be very elegant, but like the informa informationalization of warfare in the sense that the drone doesn't exist in its own environment. It exists in a huge amount of data that it is collecting, but it is also receiving. Uh, and so it is, you know, it's, it's a really, an, it's more an outcome of the new, a new form of warfare where uh, data uh, is, is everything. Um, and um, so, and uh, you know, there's a moral case for drones, which they are more discriminatory. I mean, the reason that the civilian death toll in CIA drone strikes is at zero or close to zero is because, um, you know, they're, they're, they can linger over a target for a very long time. They're much more discriminating than F-16s or anything like that. And certainly we're going to see, as we did in Iraq so vividly and horribly, uh, in the use of IEDs, these improvised explosive mm -hmm. devices, that uh, whatever, e even the, the low-level technology that is, that is widely available, there will be very creative minds that find crude but probably highly effective and terrible ways to use them. Well, I think, you know, personal, you know, you could imagine a very nasty divorce being sort of settled with a drone, an armed drone at a certain point. <laughs> I mean, not, not next year, but... 
But certainly, you know, in our lifetimes, these are going to proliferate as weapons that uh, fairly ordinary people can use. And, and the issues that surround it also get to some pretty serious questions that, that relate to international law and questions that have been yeah. around for a long time. Uh, the notion of a just war, the notion of reciprocation. Uh, we, we don't talk about this a lot uh, because, because of the Cold War, actually. The Cold War uh, got us in this posture of that, well, war means apocalypse, and mm. hopefully there's nothing in between. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and so we stopped... Uh, we stopped talking as much about that if the tradition, the long tradition that's also embodied in international law, that if a country does something to another country, that that victim country has some right to reciprocate, but not necessarily do more than reciprocate. Yeah. Uh, there are notions about how much shelling is legal. You can shell a town, but you can't overshell it, and where you target your shelling. There, there are those notions in, in the law, and there's also uh, a human tradition uh, that, from going back to the Middle Ages, that the assassin, the assassin is the most despicable figure, uh, almost universally viewed as uh, the most amoral character, perhaps necessary, but, the, but an amoral figure in a conflict. Mm. Uh, well, arguably drones are, are, uh, are a kind of high-tech device for assassination. We've reconciled ourselves a long time ago to snipers, and, we, and now the, uh, an American sniper is the one great hero of the mm. endless war, which is a curious thing in itself. Mm. But, uh, but drones are a kind of, arguably, a, a device for high-tech assassination, something that humans have generally viewed as profoundly immoral. Yeah. Well, is it more immoral to drop, you know, fire a bomb Dresden and kill hundreds of thousands of people in the space of, a, you know, that, that there seems to be no, dip, you know, a very big distinction. So, uh, you know, this is the future of warfare. Uh, we're going to have to work it out. I think that we haven't worked out. We have created a set of precedents that uh, other countries could call upon. So, for instance, the Chinese could say, Uyghur sec separatists that we regard as terrorists who are just over the, our border in Afghanistan, we're going to take out with a drone. Yeah, and, the, and at the same time, I think Russia just a week or so ago uh, was exhibiting uh, their new tank, uh, which has a sort of a certain degree of uh, remote operability. That's an element of it. We've experimented a lot. The U.S. military contractors mm. are working on drone tanks and motorized uh, guns that would move along with infantrymen on the ground. Well, that's where, that's where your moral question comes in. So when, how can you teach autonomous weapon systems to, have be, to make uh, moral decisions? And I, I, I'm not a philosopher. I, I think that you can't. And right now, the U.S. government, U.S. Air Force position is we will never create an autonomous, a fully autonomous system. But the technology is running ahead. So, for instance, the British have developed uh, sort of drones that were sort of drones that would kind of come out with even more drones. And I mean, at a certain point, it's sort of like, well, how the it, it already you could see. I mean, when I've had discussions with people who know a lot about this issue, you used to be in the U.S. Air Force. You know, if another country sort of developed an autonomous drone system, you know, it would be very hard for us potentially to sort of say we won't do that. And by the way, interestingly, the United States has said that we will now export armed drones to any country that, uh, that we think fits certain kind of, and the reason we're doing that, I hadn't intuited this, is because we just don't want to lose to the Israelis uh, on this issue, because the Israelis are the biggest exporter of drones and drone technology in the world, and they are, what, you know, they are and it's simply a commercial decision at this point. And it's interesting that in the Cold War period, we had an active debate around a lot of these questions. I and mean, there's a whole mm -hmm. body of literature and filmmaking. Uh, the movie Failsafe uh, is a you know, sort of famous uh, um, uh, dramatic depiction of when the system goes wrong, where there's supposedly human control, but then once the bombers pass the failsafe point, mm -hmm. you can't call them back. Uh, and then you, we end up with Henry Fonda on the phone with somebody playing Khrushchev, uh, trying mm -hmm. to convince each other how we can bring down these American fighters. The ultimate resolution, if you remember that film, is that we can't stop them, and the bomb, the, the atomic bombs fall on mm -hmm. Moscow, killing the entire government of Russia. But to preserve the Earth, the President of the United States agrees to bomb with nuclear weapons the city of New York to yeah. kill an equal number of <laughs> Americans. That's mutually assured destruction. <laughs> but as a society, we had an anxiety about these things that I think was more, uh, more fully realized, uh, and maybe more because the stakes were that much higher. The other thing, of course, is we have, we, we're very comfortable, and this is the counter-argument, is that in our own lives, we're very comfortable now with a huge amount of automation uh, that just exists uh, as just sort of baked into our, the way we live. So it may be, I mean, you may be, the point, Americans over time may evolve to the point where they just don't think automated weapons are a bad thing. Uh, 
because so many things are automated. Once every, you know, they're, once all your house cleaning has been done by a robot, so why? And we don't have to fight in the army anymore. We just right. let the professional guys take care of that. Uh, so maybe that is where we're headed. Let me ask you one last question. The, we're moving into an important presidential campaign, uh, an important really? change of the guard. Yes, I, you may have heard. <laughs> you may have heard about that. If you're sitting down with the newly elected president but before he or she is sworn in, uh, and you've got five minutes, one minute, to say, uh, here's what you must do to confront these issues that we've been talking about. What's your prescription for the new president? Well, one of them is a rather small one, which is we should not get out of Afghanistan at the end of 2016. We've just seen what a disaster that was in Iraq. And ISIS already has a small foothold there. And, uh, you know, we were attacked from there. And Afghans want us to stay. They're begging us to stay. And we have, a, I think, a, a duty to stay in a lot of ways to make it work. Um, and um, so that, you know, that, that is one concrete idea. Peter Bergen, security analyst for CNN, thank you for being thank here. You. Thank you. The book is, the most recent one is, Drone Wars. To learn more about Peter Bergen and his book, to send us a comment, to download a podcast of this and other episodes, or to read a transcript, visit us at millercenter.org, where American Forum is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm Doug Blackman. See you next time. <laughs>